On the morning of Saturday, October 12th, Elliot Kipchoge became the first person in history to complete a marathon in under two hours. His time, one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds. In order to inspire many people, to tell people that uh, no human is limited, you can do it, I'm expecting more. It is a major milestone for athletics, comparable in significance to Roger Bannister running the mile in under four minutes. The marathon was staged specifically for Kipchoge, and he was aided throughout by coordinated groups of pacers. He was also racing on a fast course and wearing some very fancy and very controversial shoes. With us today to talk about how all of those factors came together in Kipchoge's race on Saturday is Dr. Michael Joyner. Dr. Joyner is a world-renowned expert in human performance, and also, about 30 years ago, you wrote a paper positing that a sub-two-hour marathon was possible. What were the biggest factors that came together to produce this unprecedented time? Right, well you have really a truly superior generational athlete who's, who's been very good at distance running for a long time, who's typically never had a bad day in the marathon, but also has excellent times at shorter events. He's mm -hmm. run a mile in close to three minutes and 50 seconds. So a superior athlete. Uh, Mr. Kipchoge trains really, really hard. He's been able to avoid injury over many, many years. So he's been able to be very consistent. So I think you start with the athlete, then the course, a, a, a very flat course with minimal turns is helpful. And then the pacing scheme that, that the, they use and also the shoes. It was Kipchoge's second attempt at breaking the two hour barrier. The first came in 2017. At the time, we examined what it would take for somebody to break the two hour barrier in our first episode of Almost Impossible by inviting Wired staff members to try running on a treadmill at two hour marathon pace. And it did not go as well as we'd hoped. That's, that's impossible. <laughs> he did manage to finish the marathon faster than anyone had in history, but he still came short of his goal. Fast forward two years and Kipchoge has pulled it off. So I was just kind of uh, really in awe of the whole thing as I watched him, him do this, but it, it really, frankly, was not that surprising based on what we'd seen a couple of years ago. After what we saw in 2017, I was pretty confident he would do it, barring misfortune, getting tripped, a cramp, something like that, and if the weather cooperated. Uh, a lot of people, including myself, felt he would have done it in 2017 if it had been five, 10 degrees cooler. So I was mostly focused on just this tremendous sense of rhythm and tempo I saw and the tremendous effort he was putting forth and at the same time his ability to relax. What are the major takeaways from Kipchoge breaking two in Vienna? Well, really standard stuff for any athlete. You need to be consistent. You need to learn how to manage your effort and you need to learn how to put forth great effort and relax at the same time. Then there are larger logistical lessons that could be adopted by other marathons in terms of getting an optimal course improving the field, uh, running the course at the right time of day under good weather conditions, mm -hmm. that could lead other uh, people to run very, very fast marathons in the near future. Why isn't Kipchoge's performance in Vienna eligible for world record consideration? Uh, I think there are two main reasons. The first is, is the pacing strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, the pacers did not start the race with him, and the fact that they drifted in and out or came in and out in shifts uh, was, was one real problem in terms of a record. The second is that um, Water was handed to him by people riding bikes versus having to stop at the aid stations and, right. and grab the fluids. So those would be the two of the main reasons that it was not, not record eligible. Yeah. On top of being a tremendous athlete, right. he was also running this at an exhibition event Correct. on a fast course with some pacers and some shoes. Right. Let's go through each of those one by one and talk about <laughs> sort right. of what kind of impact they might have yep. had on this already phenomenal athlete. Right. Right. So let's start first with the course. This was an exhibition event right. staged specifically for Kipchoge. And what does that mean? That just means no other people were doing the race with him? No other people were doing the race. They actually had a window of days so they could, and time so they could wait for good weather. They had a good weather on the, on the first day of, of, of their window, so that worked well. Uh, then they were running down one of the great avenues in Vienna, an old imperial uh, road from the Habsburg Empire, which is straight, and then they had a lollipop essentially on each end, so they minimize the number of turns. It's known especially that right angle turns cost you about a second per turn. So they really only had six or eight turns the whole, whole course and they were relatively gradual. And the course was completely flat, uh, close to sea level. Mm -hmm. So there was plenty of oxygen around. And there might have been a few bumps in the course, but actually that may be a little bit better than a completely flat, flat course 
because it breaks up your biomechanical pattern a little bit. So the course itself, super right. fast, right. right off the bat, a good sign that things are going to go well. Correct. He also had this pace group. Right. Now, what was unique about the pace group? Well, they essentially ran in formation uh, with Mr. Kipchoge uh, behind several pacers. Now, they ran kind of an inverted V. In 2017, they tried more of a, what looked like a flock of birds mm -hmm. flying, where he was protected. Uh, there's some data going back to the, about 1970 by a man named Griffith Pugh, who was a well-known physiologist. Pugh had done some very interesting work on pacing and showed that if people even ran single fire, file at about the speeds Kipchoge was running at, they could expect to reduce their energy costs significantly and, and get an edge. So I think a lot of people might be surprised to hear that drag would be right. would have as big an impact. And I think there's sort of two things that are important, right? One is that the faster you go, Correct. the more resistance you experience. And, and over two hours, it adds right. up. Right. If you start getting a percent here and a percent there, each percent is a little bit over a minute because a two hour marathon is 120 minutes. So if you even just get one or two percents from the, the drafting and pacing, mm -hmm. uh, that's very helpful. In a record eligible marathon, my understanding is the pacers are required to start right. with the front runners, right. and they can only lead the group for as long as they are able to run. So what was unique about the pacing wasn't just the configuration that they occupied. It was also the fact that they stuck with him the entire race. Right. He had people the whole way, right. as you point out, and there were several, yeah. as opposed to just one or two. And besides the drafting, uh, there's a psychological price you pay uh, when you're in front. And I think having people to take the pace and you be able to kind of uh, tap into their rhythm can be very, very helpful. The third and I think probably most controversial element of this race was the shoes that Kipchoge was wearing. Right. In 2017 at Monza, he wore a special elite version of a shoe Nike calls the Vaporfly 4%. Right. And that 4% refers to how much more economical the shoe is purported to make runners. The shoe he wore in Vienna, he'd never worn in a race. Right. And is, is faster even, supposedly. So this raises this question of technological doping. Right. Is that something that people should be legitimately concerned about? Uh, how big of an impact do you think it had in this race? So what's novel about the shoes is that they have a carbon plate in the midsole. And the carbon plate in the midsole is uh, thought to be able to, to make the runners more efficient or more economical as a result of, of capturing more of the recoil from landing and then pushing off. Mm -hmm. There have been several iterations of the shoes, and he's run in several generations of them, including apparently a custom built pair with, with more or different carbon plates right. in Vienna. It mm -hmm. certainly had an impact. Aero bikes have made a huge difference in cycling. The uh, tech suits in swimming, which were subsequently banned, made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And really, maybe the best analogy are so-called clap or slap skates in speed skating, where there's actually a hinged skate that permitted people to get a bit more push off and transfer more force, which revolutionized speed skating. And there's a big controversy about it, but you know, golf clubs have changed, pole ball poles have changed, tennis rackets have changed, bikes have changed, and, and so forth. So it seems to be kind of sport specific and, and nobody's decided to regulate what. I think that the, the, the cat is out of the bag with the shoes. And when I talk to my biomechanics colleagues, uh, they think it would be trivial for people to engineer the midsoles of shoes using any number of techniques. It seems to me that one of the biggest issues surrounding the shoes is that if it is a technology proprietary to Nike, right. then Nike athletes have an unfair advantage over right. athletes not sponsored by Nike, which in that case is actually the swimsuit analogy is very apt, right? Because it was Speedo. And right. so it was Speedo athletes just swept the Olympics right. that year, right? So. Uh, when you say the cat's out of the bag and that people should be able to sort of right. engineer another version of it, what right. I'm hearing is that that should permeate throughout the rest of the shoe market and then right. re-level the playing field. That, that would be my hope. You know, a lot of people place emphasis on fast course, right. uh, a, a systematized pace group, fancy shoes, but at the bottom of all of those, sort of the thing that all of those things are orbiting is this athlete, right. Kipchoge, right? And like, there are 10 people on earth who can run a marathon in under two hours, five minutes this year. Right. And Kipchoge is the fastest. Right. And so it's, yes, those three things matter, but on anybody else, it's not a given that they'd be able to run in under two hours. Well, and that's one of the things people have to think about when you talk about technology or some of these strategies is, is you have to be really a superior athlete to, to leverage them. Even though this is not an official world record, it's still significant. Why? 
Well, for somebody to go out and run 26 miles and in, in change in just a little over 430 per mile, a time which would win most high school track meets, or under 2830 per 10,000 meters, that's quite remarkable. Yeah. Quite remarkable. It's incredible. You sort of, yeah. no matter what circumstances right. in which it's run, right? It's, yeah, yeah it, it is quite remarkable. And the other thing that always happens when you see somebody break a barrier like this is people begin to think about what's possible and, and maybe push themselves a little bit harder. I think we may see this in an open race sooner than people think. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It was great fun to talk to you, Rob. Yeah, likewise.